called the Mars Rate Desert Hypothesis, as you see here. And uh, the question is, uh, the rate group uh, found that there was a time in Earth's history uh, that there was accelerated uh, radio, radioisotope decay. That means the radioactive rocks uh, were giving out radiation at millions to billions of times faster. And this is the reason why the rocks, when you use the idea that the rates are, are slow as they are today and constant, that you come up with billions of years at, uh, of ages, uh, in the rocks on the Earth, but this all happened much, much more rap rapidly, and the Ray group showed uh, uh, reasons and and uh, showed evidence and much evidence about this. And I would encourage you to uh, pick up a little paperback book called Thou Not Thou uh, Not uh, Billions, but Thousands, Thousands, Not Billions, uh, uh, by Dr. DeYoung. And uh, you should, and if you're not familiar with this material, you need to be, and uh, you need to use that to discuss it with uh, your friends and the people that are, are basically against creationism because of the age problem. Well, my application here is that I believe that the rate uh, event, the rate events, uh, affected the entire solar system and maybe the entire universe at large. And we can see one of the results of that uh, on the Earth, and that's our flood event that we talked about, uh, that has been talked about over and over again. And, uh, but suppose that same event that, uh, that caused all the activity on the Earth and the flood and so forth that took place, took place on Mars also. And uh, so that's what we're looking at tonight. We propose that the rate episodes or episode uh, produced a history of volcanic eruptions on Mars. And we'll show you how volcanic eruptions can produce, uh, can produce a great torrential rainfall, can produce floods, and uh, so it produced a, 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 a terraformed uh, Mars, a Mars that would look much like the Earth, that had an ocean, that had had rivers and lakes and all these different things. Uh, but the problem is on Mars is that the gravity is very low. And in a very short time, uh, this, the water uh, evaporates away and the atmosphere becomes very cold and very thin. And uh, you only end up uh, with water in the form of ice. And the ice is in the ice caps, the ice is in the ground and the permafrost. And we're gonna show you evidence for all this and uh, show you how this all, t all ties together. And uh, so basically, look at Mars now. It is a desert climate. It is a dry desert place. And the only evidence that you find for the water are in the dried up riverbeds. And we'll show you those. And in the permafrost that you can scrape the ground and you can find the ice down, down low in the ground and also in the ice caps, frozen in the ice caps. And so we're taking, looking tonight at the Mars Desert Hypothesis. Well, Mars is an interesting place, and uh, you can look at some of the uh, information about Mars here. Uh, Mars, the actual orbital period is about two years, and uh, you see the inclination of orbit is 25 degrees, very close to the 23 degrees we find on the Earth, now what that means is that Mars has seasons, and has seasons much like the Earth, except the seasons are double in length. They're six months long, roughly, than, than our, uh, our, our three months, and so it's, everything is doubled in length, approximately. Uh, you see the density is lower, but it is a hard rock surface, and uh, so you can walk around. There are caves and all kinds of interesting things on Mars, and uh, interesting uh, geologic uh, effects. Uh, another thing you notice down at the bottom there is the temperatures are very, very cold. And uh, some people have said, like in this slide here, it says the maximum temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know where they got that at, but the temperatures seldom rise above freezing. And it's usually below freezing almost every place all year long 
even during the deepest part of summer. And, uh, and also you might notice, uh, we'll notice about the, uh, the atmospheric pressure is very low. Okay, how do we know about all this information about Mars? Well, it comes from our space probes. And uh, we've sent many successful space probes uh, that have orbited around and landed on Mars and have got, given us much, much information. Uh, right now, if you go on the NASA site, you'll see, you'll see a, uh, a spacecraft called MAVEN. And uh, you see MAVEN, a picture of MAVEN there. And MAVEN is supposed to look at the atmosphere and how, it's, how Mars is losing its atmosphere. And of course, this is a part of the whole, of the whole story. A little picture here that you see, you see an ice scoop here. Uh, that was from the Phoenix Polar Lander. And basically, the lander was on the ground, dug into the ground, and showed a big scoop of ice here. It shows that there is ice and snow and so forth on, in the ground on Mars, mostly covered with regolith, uh, regolith which is uh, stuff that gets blown out of craters as when, when, uh, when uh, uh, meteoroids, hit, hit meteoroids hit the surface, uh, producing this, this, uh, this dust that covers everything. Well, in the beginning, the first spacecraft that landed brought back these disappointing pictures. Mars had craters. And uh, people had hoped that Mars would be a place of life and maybe intelligent life. And uh, so this was, this was, as I said, very disappointing to see that it looked more like the moon <laughs> than, it did, than it did Mars. And this, this very low resolution picture is the first image uh, showing this. However, there's another image, not too many, uh, not too many images down, down the way, that actually showed us what appeared to be an atmosphere. So what's going on here? We have an atmosphere, but we have, we have these uh, craters. Uh, most likely, however, this was a dust star. And uh, so it wasn't quite the same thing. All right, so Mariner 4 found that the atmospheric pressure was quite low. Uh, the uh, atmospheric pressure on the Earth is about one bar, or 1,000 millibars. Well, on Mars, it's only from 2.8 to 10.3. Uh, someone has said that's equivalent to uh, being in the Earth's atmosphere at 50,000 feet. And we all know that we can't breathe at 50,000 feet. <laughs> but, uh, but that's how it is on the surface of Mars. Very low atmosphere, very weak atmosphere. Uh, Mar Mariner 6 and 7, um, I might go through some of these rather quickly, showed uh, s more re higher resolution images there. But, but we still see craters. Uh, here is an interesting picture uh, taken by Mariner 9, and this was uh, showing the northern polar cap. And uh, northern polar cap up here, uh, this is actually during summer. And during summer what happens is the carbon dioxide, the dry ice that covers the northern polar cap is evaporated away. And so we can actually see the water. There is water ice on Mars in the northern polar caps. And uh, it's certainly weak, but it's there. And uh, here is uh, the uh, caldera, the crater at the top of the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And this is a key factor as we talk about this event. Now this is interesting. Uh, you see the craters here, but you notice uh, in our picture that Everything is kind of soft and mushy looking there. And maybe with frost and so forth. And so Mars turns out to be kind of an in-between place. A place that does have some ice and, and uh, snow and dry ice and so forth. But it still has the, the craters like, like the moon. Here was a usual picture of temperature ranges. This is a plot. Uh, showing the temperature ranges over the number of days that Viking 1 was taking temperatures and here Viking 2. And you notice the temperature range runs from negative 80 to negative 20, sometimes inching up to zero and peaking up, up above 
above freezing just for a very short time in, uh, in the middle of the summer. And uh, so these are the kind of, this is the kind of temperature range you're talking about. Fantastically cold and uh, the atmosphere is, is very thin. Uh, now, this is, a, is an interesting picture. Uh, it showed uh, not snow, but the dry ice collecting on the surface uh, as, as we go into evening here and you get very cold and the dry ice starts to form across the surface there. Not snow, but dry ice. Uh, one thing very interesting was going on at this time was that the pressure gauges, so the pressure was dropping as the ice was forming. I always ask my students why. And the reason is, is that the atmosphere is so thin that when the carbon dioxide becomes ice on the ground, it's removed from the atmosphere and so the pressure drops. And uh, so you can tell a difference between when it's snowing or not, uh, it would be the atmospheric pressure would drop as it collects on the ground and basically the atmosphere is collecting on the ground when that happens. Uh, one of our spacecraft, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter there, uh, showed some interesting images here. This one uh, detected ice in the ground. You can see these blue areas here and possibly due to glaciation. Here is a, a crater uh, from an asteroid, uh, not an asteroid, but a meteor strike. And you can see the white stuff on the sides here. And that's water ice, that's clean ice. So when the meteors come and hit the ground and break the ground open, uh, we get a, a melt and a refreezing. We get, we get uh, a picture that shows us that ice is buried underneath the surface there. Very strange kind of environment. Here's a, a complete image uh, a, uh, of the surface of Mars, uh, showing the surface uh, topography there. And uh, you can see interesting area here that's very flat on the top here. Other areas here are, is, is, uh, are volcanoes. You can see the calderas in the top and there are other volcanoes around. Uh, there are a couple of big areas that look like mare uh, look like mares on the moon, where possibly asteroids struck, leaving these big gaping holes there in the, sur in the surface. Uh, you'll notice that there is what's called a crustal dichotomy, that there's a big flat area on the top here in the northern part, and then mountainous areas here on the south. Uh, it's possible that this was an area that, the northern area was an area that where there was an ocean, and maybe these, uh, Mare areas were areas of inland lakes and they were maybe possibly bays and shores and so forth along here when the oceans were prevalent. Well, let's give you some evidence, <coughs> more evidence of water on Mars and its effects. First, we do see water ice clouds and uh, they're pretty prevalent on the surface. It was a <coughs> major evidence and that is we have, if you look from the uh, aerial photos here, you see uh, dendritic flows. That means there were, these were rivers at one time, breaking up like the rivers we see on the earth. But of course, everything is dried up now. And we see, of course, the craters around there. Uh, here's some channels uh, on the sides of, uh, of uh, craters and uh, in the general topography. This looks like a, uh, a spring broke up out of the groundwater and flowed for a short time and created an alluvial fan. And this, the picture on the right, I'm sorry, on the left here, shows the blue, the blue uh, colors and the mud colors here to show you what it might have looked like when there was actual mud and water there. And this is the actual image on the right-hand side uh, showing that uh, there's actually nothing there now. Uh, but you can see the flows were very possible. Here is uh, uh, some teardropped uh, islands around craters. So the water flowed around the craters uh, and uh, created these teardrop shapes. Let's put in some water just for fun here. 
And uh, you can see the water flowing around, creating all these teardrop shapes around the mountains and craters and so forth. Uh, this is very interesting, this particular picture. This is an image uh, taken uh, on the Earth, okay, an aerial photo showing an oxbow lake. Okay, how many of you have seen an oxbow lake before? You've seen the rivers and so forth that break up this way. Now here is an oxbow lake on Mars. Do you see something interesting about it? Do you notice the shadows? The oxbow lake here is actually above the ground. And so what has happened here is in that lake, there are all kinds of rocks that are pushed around. And so what happened over time here, the rocks and so forth uh, made, a, made an area where the erosion couldn't get into. And the erosion blew the sand and uh, sand storms and so forth, blew uh, the stuff away around the outside of the lake, leaving these, these, these uh, lakes and so forth up resin. They, actually, there's no lakes there anymore. They're just, they're just basically roads of rock. I guess you could drive on them now. But the rocks there uh, have been left high and dry because they were, they were planted and moved there by rivers. And now they create erosion, erosion uh, zone that there is no erosion. And so you end up with these things lifted high and, and uh, dry, so to speak. Very interesting kind of phenomena. Can you imagine on the moon a asteroid coming in? Boom, hitting the surface and then melting a bunch of subsurface water and the water flows out as a mud flow? Well, that's what happens on Mars. The ice melts and you end up with mud flows around the craters. And uh, so here is uh, a picture of that showing that this subsurface ice is there and it, it can melt for a short time and uh, flow for a short time, then it uh, evaporates or sublimates. That means it goes directly into the atmosphere and there is no water. But anyway, uh, we can have it for a short time. There is sedimentation. And let's put a little water in this picture here. This is, again, on Mars, showing uh, sediments, uh, sediment with your layers and so forth from a dried seabed. Uh, did you ever see a crater like this one? Well, this crater was once filled with water and has a bunch of bathtub rings there. As the water subsided, it created these sedimentary rings. And let's put a little water in there. I didn't want to put so much water that we detect every single ring, but it would slowly dry out and slowly go away. And uh, so isn't it, it's very interesting, the phenomena on Mars, on the sides of the craters where asteroids have hit or meteors have hit, uh, they have gouged out the uh, craters and on the walls you'll notice that there are flows. These are called gullies. And you notice the gullies are a little bit underneath the surface where they start flowing here. And that means the permafrost was down a little bit. Uh, and uh, the uh, regolith, uh, the dust and so forth, had built up above them. And you can see these flows here coming down. This is a close-up of the same area. And it shows us this effect. Gullies. Lots of clouds. And uh, yes, some of these are CO2, uh, you know, uh, they're dry ice or CO2 type clouds. But in this particular case, these are orographic uh, W are water clouds, and if you know anything about meteorology, uh, you could tell me more about the W clouds than I know, but they basically form at the tops of mountains uh, as the air pushes the, uh, the uh, water-laden air up to the top, and it, it uh, cools and creates these clouds. And these are, in this particular one, these are in the Tharsis range, right at the tips of these volcanoes. Olympus Mons is right here, and here's the Tharsis volcanoes that I'll talk about over and over again. Here is a storm. Uh, you can see a cloud system here uh, right next to the northern polar cap, right? 
And you see all that in other pictures here. It's a little better picture here. But you can see the cloud regions around there. Now, another effect that we see all over Mars that are related to all these other phenomena are volcanoes. And this is, of course, in the left-hand corner there is uh, Olympus Mons. Here is Olympus Mons, uh, 600 kilometers across the base, uh, 400 miles. Fantastic volcano, 24 kilometers height uh, to the tip. These scarps here, these scarps are six kilometers high and bigger than anything that we have around here. And that's just the base of this huge shield volcano. Now, shield volcano, what happens in a shield volcano is there are alternating eruptions, uh, ash explosions, and lava flows. And the lava flows then create these layers and build up these volcanoes. This is the largest volcano in the solar system. And uh, <coughs> if one of these days you you visit Mars, this will probably be on your top checklist of uh, think places to see. And this is Olympus Mont. You'd have to see it from an from a airplane or something, uh, whatever you could fly with over. Probably have to be some kind of rocket or balloon or something to fly over Mars. But anyway, another one of these huge volcanoes, Arshamans, Bilbus Patera, another huge uh, shield volcano. Now, this picture gives you an idea of how big these volcanoes were. And this is a Tharsis range right here. And Olympus Mons is off to the left, even larger. You see that this, this particular volcano will cover almost the entire state of Washington. <laughs> these are super volcanoes. These are fantastic volcanoes. And if you don't tie them into your ideas about Mars, there's something wrong with your with your theories. They are one of the major things that caused uh, events on Mars. Now, on the Earth, we have a ring of volcanoes around what's called the Ring of Fire. And these zones are, are plates in the plate tectonics. The Earth's surface is broken up into plates. And uh, a man named John Baumgartner uh, believes this happened during the flood, that the surface of the earth shattered into plates and these plates move around and uh, that there was a catastrophic movement of these. Uh, as they move, when you have a volcano, what happens? You have a hot spot and the plate moves by. And so volcanoes are created in, in, uh, in a chain as they pass by this hot spot as they come by, and there's the Hawaiian chain. Uh, and these volcanoes, however, they're, however big, uh, that created these islands and so forth, are much, much smaller than the ones on Mars. Here's the same kind of image on Mars. Here's the Tharsis Range, those same three volcanoes that we saw before. Uh, they had the western United States laid on top, and this is Olympus Mons here. Other volcanoes uh, are around and uh, the difference on Mars is that we don't have plate tectonics. The hot spots, the places where there's lots of radioisotopes, rocks that are radioactive, uh, just melt the material around it and keep on melting it, heating it up, and keep on melting and heating it up, making the volcano erupt over and over again and grow bigger and bigger and bigger and make these huge super volcanoes instead of chains of volcanoes like we have on the Earth. Well, my scenario, my theory, is that uh, what explains all this is this Mars desert hypothesis. And the method of occurrence, the, the reason why this happened, was accelerated radioact radioisotope decay, a sudden burst of radiation from these rocks that created these hot flows in a catastrophic way. Uh, you see, I'm a creationist, and I believe that the solar system is only uh, six to eight, maybe to ten on the outside, thousands of years old. And things happen quickly and catastrophically. So you hear us saying the word catastrophic many times because things had to happen fast. And things happen in the short, short time range. 
Uh, this is a common sight out in the western U.S. and in Mexico. This is a river. <laughs> now this river is swollen and filled with water every season. But then a few months later, it's dried up. And uh, so I used to go to, uh, to Lowell Observatory uh, out in Arizona. And there was a, a lake there called Lake Mary. And sometimes Lake Mary doesn't have a drop of water in it, at least lower Lake Mary, because it's completely dried up in the dry season. And then other times in the year, it's filled with water and people are out fishing in it and so forth. And so this is the kind of thing that I've had uh, firsthand experience in. And uh, Mexicans call this ar these arroyos, or dried up riverbeds. And uh, in Mexico and Arizona, these are seasonal occurrence. There is a season called a monsoon season happening sometime in August, sometimes July. And it, it all of a sudden it'll rain and flood and uh, have these things all filled up. And then a short time later, they're all evaporated and gone and uh, things are just dry uh, like we see on Mars. So I thought, well, that's what's happening on Mars, except it's not happening in a seasonal way. Because we've been looking at Mars for some 400 years, and it's pretty much looked the same all that time. So you can extend the seasons out to a very long time, and uh, because of the thinness of the atmosphere, and uh, basically, uh, this is the idea that I had, that this cycle is repeating over and over again, but it's happening over a long time range, over, over hundreds and thousands of years. So by analogy, Mars is an extreme desert. There may be a history of volcanic eruptions producing rain, flash floods, and volcanic flows, followed by the evaporation uh, thinning of the atmosphere, alternating with long periods of drought. And during the dry times, asteroids can hit and strike the surface, and uh, because the atmosphere in a short time is all leaked away into space because the gravity can't hold on to that atmosphere, and uh, so there's no shield for these asteroids. So the asteroids come in and pummel the surface, leaving these, uh, leaving these craters behind, and uh, there's no erosion to wash them away like happened on the Earth. And uh, there's all kinds of dusty material all over the, the uh, planet from, from the stuff that's been blasted out of these, uh, of these craters. Now, uh, I want to go through and explain this to you in a, de in a detailed way, but kind of abbreviated way, so I know I'm rushing here. And uh, if you want to read more about this, you can find this on, on internet, site talking, internet sites talking about this, this, uh, this uh, process. So if you listen, I'll go through this thing and use these, use these uh, memory devices here to help me <laughs> to remember. All right, so this is the surface of, of Mars when we do have some water here. And actually, it's kind of a cross picture here. Uh, showing a lot of different uh, things here. So the volcanoes here erupt and they produce uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and other, other materials, sulfur dioxide and so forth. And those are, those are greenhouse gases and they go into the atmosphere, create clouds, warm things up in atmosphere. There's rainfall. The rainfall creates streams and lakes and terraforms, that means makes, the Mar makes Mars Earth-like and uh, for a brief time. But what's missing is there's no carbon cycle because there are no plants. And so we don't have that cycle going on. Well, the rain, we get torrential rains and the rain starts taking out the carbon dioxide and the sulfur dioxide out of the atmosphere, thinning out the atmosphere and so this causes cooling, and as the atmosphere cools, we get more and more precipitation. You notice a cold front comes in and it rains around here, and that's the same kind of thing that would happen there. So more rain happens. This takes more CO2 and SO2 and uh, material out of the atmosphere, and uh, then it cools more and more and more and more. 
And that causes a, what's called a, not a greenhouse effect, but a runaway ice house effect. That's a freezing effect. And uh, what happens is the water that's around freezes out into the soil, the soil-soaked soil. And uh, so the atmosphere is very thin, allowing ultraviolet radiation to come in and break down the uh, molecules that are in the atmosphere. Many of it is leach, goes, goes away and leaves the atmosphere. Uh, some of the oxygen has gone into the ground, uh, rusting the surface of irony materials that were on the surface of Mars. What do you see when you look at Mars in the heavens tonight? You'll see it's red. It's the red planet. And it is rusted with all this oxygen that used to be, used to be in the atmosphere. And uh, <clears throat> some of the carbon dioxide is broken apart. But because carbon dioxide is so heavy, a lot of it, at least some portion of it, still stays around. And so if you look at the atmosphere at Mars today, it's all CO2, all carbon dioxide, almost completely carbon dioxide. And that's what's left. Now the water, the carbon dioxide does go into the water and create carbonates, and that's what shellfish are made of. They're made of, these, they're, they're made of carbonate rock, but not on Mars, because there were no shellfish on Mars. But uh, the carbonate rocks are very rare on Mars, and so that's been a problem with this, this idea. And uh, I believe that the carbonates are buried. They're buried under the regolith that's been blown out by the uh, by the uh, uh, meteors striking the surface, creating all these craters and so forth. And uh, so what should happen is that the carbon rocks are, are, are now hidden. However, uh, there have been some areas of carbonate rocks that have been found by the, by the Martian probes. And so they're not completely lost at this point. <clears throat> now, because the, the wet and dry seasons alternate, what happens is the regolith and the carbonate alternate in the soil, and uh, the presently exposed rocks are all meteor, uh, metamorphic igneous type of rocks uh, from, from volcanic flows. Now, some of the water has gone into the ice caps, the rest in permafrost, and uh, when asteroids strike the surface and you actually can uh, it actually gets down to this material. It will get melts and mud flows and uh, gullies and so forth. And so all these things are still happening because of the frozen ice in the uh, subsurface Mars. During the freezing time, there should be glaciers. You should have glacier flows on Mars. You say, are there any glacier type of uh, phenomena on Mars? Yes, there are. Here is a, a valley glacier on Mars and showing that there were ice, ice flows and there's the glacial till uh, around the flow, there's a U-shaped valley and there are a number of these features on Mars covered however with dust, with regolith dust. And so there's no, they're not shiny white, they're dirty looking. Terminal moraines, if you know something about those kind of things. Uh, recently, National Geographic has, uh, uh, hasn't had an article and uh, it said these same things that I've said. I ran across this stuff while I was doing this, this study and the, it turns out that, that the secular uh, scientists are agreeing with me that the volcanoes are so large they would create these, these uh, an atmosphere on Mars and would create uh, w water and oceans and some possible uh, water flows and oceans and streams and so forth. And uh, this particular article says that Tharsis Range volcanoes are still active. And this might happen again. And uh, one of these days you might go to Mars after one of these events and you can actually think it's like the earth, except where's the green? <laughs> there wouldn't be any, any plants and stuff growing there because God created the plants here on the, on the earth. And uh, so there is some agreement. Sky and Telescope, over in the left-hand corner here, Sky and Telescope said that volcanic eruptions pump tremendous amount of quantities of gases in the atmosphere. Well, at a recent American Astronomical Society meeting, 
uh, Dr. Don Sumner, senior geologist at, for the Curiosity Mars mission, was there, gave a talk, and she was walking around through the poster paper area, where I give a lot of my papers as poster papers, and she was, I noticed she was there, so I said, I'm going to ask her a question. And so I asked her, I said, where did all the water come from on Mars? And she looked at me, and she said, ah, oh, probably comets. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, some creationists have said that. <laughs> and I said, what about the volcanoes? Those fantastic volcanoes put out so much water and water vapor and so forth. And she said, well, they're just too young. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh because we believe in a what? In a young solar system. Along came the Mars rate, uh, the, I'm sorry, the rate project, and that's connected to, the, to my talk here. Accelerated radioactive decay induced rapid catastrophic volcanism and uh, this kind of thing on the Earth. But suppose this happened on Mars. And so this was my idea, was that rate, the rate processes that were approved by these gentlemen here, all these, all these PhD people supported by your money, supported by, supported by churches, uh, not NSF, uh, that did this fantastic project. And you need to know about it if you haven't, if you haven't uh, read about it. This is probably the, the, the major project of the age done by Christians, by creationists. Accelerated radioisotope decay. Now, was there more than one rate episode? Maybe there was one uh, during creation week. Uh, probably was one during the flood, before the flood probably, that continued into the flood. And uh, these produce uh, vast areas of heated subsurface magmas. Now, lava below the ground is called magma. Uh, that will result in, in volcanism. Uh, these created hot spots on the surface of the earth for the, for the radioactive materials down underneath. And... Uh, on the Earth, we have plate tectonics making chains of volcanoes. And uh, on Mars, however, we have super volcanoes because there's no plate tectonics. And uh, so we have these super volcanoes on Mars uh, creating fantastic emissions of greenhouse gases, dumping them into the atmosphere. This is really water vapor. This is an interesting photograph taken on the Earth here. Uh, so much water churning around, coming off of these volcanoes, that they create lightning. This is really common, uh, lightning in volcanic eruptions. And this is due to the same reason that you have lightning in clouds with swirling water vapor creating friction and causing these, causing, uh, these type of events to take place. And uh, volcanic emissions can be as much as 90% water vapor. And that cloudy stuff coming out of a volcano is water. It's like steam coming out of these, these uh, factories. It's mostly all water. And this water comes down as torrential rains and terraforms Mars, by the way. After volcanic eruptions on the Earth, there are torrential rains and uh, caused from all this water that is put up in the atmosphere. However, on Mars, see, Earth holds on to its atmosphere. Mars does not. And so the stuff escapes and uh, producing a desert-like topography where there are arroyos, where there's all kinds of dried up rivers and lakes and possibly even an ocean. Perhaps the very first event on the surface of Mars, we could call a, a, uh, a, a catastrophic rate emission. And perhaps that even caused the ocean that is on, appears to be on Mars. And then the, there have perhaps been multiple events of these taking place on Mars. And uh, maybe due to the first eruption and then, then, then uh, radio, radioactive isotope uh, heating afterwards caused more eruptions, or perhaps there were multiple rate e episodes 
Uh, and I say that because uh, we'll see that on Mars, there is evidence for, rap, for, for repeated events. And we'll show you that in a, in a few, few minutes here. Okay. So I mentioned in this slide that uh, maybe these areas here, Hellas Planitia, the huge mare looking event, maybe that was an inland lake, a huge lake like the Great Lakes. And maybe there was one off to the left there as you see another type of thing. And maybe these were shorelines along here and uh, of, this, of this ocean that was on Mars. If there were alternating rate events, then there should be alternating layers or sediment, sedimentation uh, layering on Mars. And is, does this exist? Yes, it does. And recently we found some of these very interesting uh, thick multiple layering uh, events. And uh, let's look at some of the images here. This was from uh, a uh, Mars spacecraft called High Rise. And this shows an area of cyclic sedimentary layers exposed in a crater. And uh, you can see multiple events uh, there recorded in the rocks. Here is uh, in Becquerel Crater. There are 10 major repeated layers here. And then inside of that, there are 10 smaller layers. Now, what the secular astronomer says uh, they say that this was due to uh, Mars flip-flopping and actually changing its inclination. And uh, that would cause these cyclic, cyclic events. Uh, I say that it was probably due to, to multiple uh, rate events on Mars. Here is the side of a crater. What do you notice? Do you notice... The, uh, the flows, do you notice the different layers here? See, there are many permafrost layers. Here's a layer here, a layer there, a layer there, a layer there, a layer there, where there are flows coming off of those uh, permafrost layers. So again, the meteor hits, scrapes out a big zone here, and you can see from flows in those various layers uh, that there are water flows coming out of those. And you can see that this gives, gives you a picture that there were multiple rate events. There are areas where this ice was frozen out and then again later, and then again later, separated by these zones of, of, uh, of regolith. And, uh, and so you can see these multiple layers showing up. In the ICC paper I did, uh, one of the referees say, make a prediction. Tell me when this thing is going to blow up again. Tell me when Mars is going to terraform. Well, if you say, uh, work on the idea that the solar system is 6,000 years old, and we look at that last zone there where there are 10, 10 different layers, we could divide 10 into 6,000 and say that these occur about every 600 years, these, these uh Emissions take place over about 600 years. Well, Galileo is, uh, was observing, didn't notice any, any uh, big spots, uh, bright spots on Mars, and that's 400 years ago. So during the entire time that we've been observing the, the heavens, it's been about 400 years. And so if it happens every 600 years, we should look forward to it happening about 200 years from now. And, uh, of course, the events are probably spreading out and slowing down. But anyway, so there is, there is my prediction. And uh, I'm sorry that it, you know, it could happen tomorrow. I don't know. We'll have to see. What did a terraform Mars look like? Looks a lot like the Earth. Except, what do you notice? You might notice the craters, right? That makes it quite a bit different. Huge craters all over the surface, which are, which are telling you that there are times when Mars is not terraformed. When Mars, the atmosphere is gone and the asteroids strike freely. And uh, so here is interesting, interesting artist's rendering. 
Now, why would raid events happen on Mars? You got to remember, there's a God in heaven. And he likes us to do science. He likes us to study the stars. He likes us to study the earth. He wants us to study these things. He wants us to do these things. And uh, that's as much of a mission as being a pastor in a church. It's giving glory to God for what he has done. So why would he have it happen on Mars too? Well, you see, the Earth is a complicated place. There, there's plate tectonics, there's all kinds of erosion going on. Uh, most of the meteor strikes on the Earth and things, they're all been wiped away. There's not much around here to really study. So why not next door to the Earth on Mars uh, have the same thing happen in a simpler place that's easier to interpret and understand. And uh, I said the same thing about uh, my paper that when I talked about the uh, mare on the moon. Why are all these huge, the man in the moon, the mare, these big black areas where asteroids struck, why are they all on one side of the moon? and uh, facing us. <laughs> and uh, it tells us that there was, a, there was a fantastic event back in time. And you can read my paper to find out what that event probably was. But uh, I think it's an, it's an important signature, it's an important thing that we should pick up on. In Psalms 33, 14, it says, from the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the habit and habits of inhabitants of the earth. God is looking at us and he's thinking about what we see and he wants to show us things so that we can offer praise to him. Psalm 66, 4, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee and, th and they shall sing to thy name, Selah. And that's what we should do is praise him for what he has done. It's the